I'm so glad to be here for, for a couple of reasons. I was, I was almost here last year. I was actually at the airport for last year's. It was April, I'll never forget it, because when I landed, uh, there was a couple of texts from my sister, Cindy, back in Nova Scotia, where I grew up in Halifax, saying, look, Dad's declining really fast, you gotta get home. And I said, yeah, right after my talk, I'll, and she said, if you can get the next flight, it's time to say goodbye. So I was, this is why I was not able to be here. I had five glorious days, five best days with my father were his last five on this earth. We got to say the things. If you've got dads, and I'm talking to sons now, say the things. You can't press pause, you cannot hit rewind. So say the things that need to be said. Maybe today will be the day that you say the things. So I'm really glad to be here. I, I feel like my dad is one of the cloud of witnesses. His name is Jack, if you're in your charity, if you remember him in your prayers. Jack Coffin, uh, handsome Jack, I called him. And uh, so I'm really finally glad to be back here. Uh, a couple things, I, I left, I, I've chosen some products tailor-made to what I think is going to be the most helpful for you to grow in your friendship with Jesus Christ. It's at the table. I have, uh, it's various kinds of apologetics, how to talk to atheists. I'm um, selling my t-shirt here. Be a saint. What else is there? Another great conversation starter. Um, I book uh, the contraception deception, which gives you a big picture look at who caused the sexual revolution. Who are the names? Fall the money. How did it affect the Catholic Church inside it? Why is humanity Mite the antidote to the chaos of the fallen, the failed sexual revolution? Also, I want to mention this too because I'm a very proud associate of Covenant Eyes. If you or someone you know wants to go from whatever porn use you're at into now to zero, test drive Covenant Eyes. If you just go there, covenanteyes.com. My first name, Patrick, gets you 30 days to test drive it. It's magnificent. It doesn't just block porn so it won't get at you, your, your family, and your kids. It's accountability software. So every single device, whether it's a tablet or a smartphone, whatever it is, once this is loaded in, every single search, every single page, goes to a third-party email. So it's not for porn reduction, it's really, truly elimination. And half the battle with sexual sin is access. Like an alcoholic, you don't hang out with your buddies at the bar anymore once you decide to, to be sober. So I highly recommend coming. I have these, by the way, at the, at the table. And remember, proceeds go to needy children. Mine. No. <laughs> So the secret key, the secret key to man, and it comes down to one word, and I'm going to attract close to that world, being holy in a hashtag world. If you haven't figured it out yet, brothers, the church does not move at the speed of Twitter. Can I hear an amen? amen. We have 2,000 years of sacred scripture, the word of God, the sacred tradition, the witness and wisdom of the saints. As Bishop Burns said so well, we've been through worse. Our faith founded upon apparent failure. The murder of her founder. They watched him be tortured. They watched him die. Doesn't get more spectacular as failures go. So we have, we have a faith that seems to be on the edge of defeat at all times. Jesus seems to be dying every generation. The Catholic faith is going to be snuffed out, whether it's communism or militant Islam or the biggest enemy, apathy. We have a whole generation, not just millennials, but the younger than millennials. I call them generation meh. You know Jesus died for your sins. That could be true. Meh. It's hard to get through to that. And we get through it to them with the message, not by arguments. Not even by apologetics, but by witness. And this is where I'm going with the secret key to Christian manhood. Jesus, I'm going to go back here. Here we go. These are, these are the two questions that we have to ask. What is a man and who is Jesus? This is a, a slightly different version of the famous quote from Mark Twain, who said the two most important days of your life are... Number one, the day you're born. Number two, 
the day you find out why. Challenges, attacks upon the faith, attacks upon the very definition of men are everywhere. You never know where it's going to come from. This is, uh, if you can click the uh, sound there. What's that? Okay. You guys know the Jeopardy theme song? <laughs> I'll try one more time. There's even technological challenges. The men face so, from so many different angles. All right, there we go. <coughs> filmed in Juneau, Alaska, right there. <laughs> All right. No killer whales were harmed in the making of this video. All right. What is a real man? I like Gordon Dalby's definition. I'm going to get to this and I'm going to repeat it because it's, it's a tautology. A real man is a man who's real. A real man is a man who's real. Now, according to our, our superiors at Facebook, the number of genders we have open to us, can you guess what Facebook assigns as the number of genders that are possible to put in your profile? Who, who thinks like seven? Twenty? Everyone laughs like this is an Onion news parody figure. As of last week, this is the official uh, cataloging of the number of genders, according to Facebook. I would suggest that there's no such thing as gender. There's only sex. God made them male and female. Now there's gender confusion, there's gender dysphoria. That's, on a, that's definitely on a scale. But to understand what Christian manhood is, we have to understand what a man is. Real men, a, man who's, a, a real man is a man who's real. You heard this, big boys don't cry? Total lie. Total lie. The shortest verse in the Bible is from John's Gospel. It's after Jesus learns that Lazarus has died. Jesus wept. Big boys do cry. Lots of reasons to cry nowadays. A lot of marriages are ending, which is kind of a suicide of the family in a way. Just heard a talk by Peter Kraft about this. Addictions, threats, loneliness. A lot of men are lonely. They might be married with 10 kids. But there's this existential loneliness that afflicts a lot of men. You've heard this sentence. I remember hearing this when I was a little kid. Don't cry or I'll give you something to cry about. Ever heard this? Well, that's charming. Thanks, Dad. I'm crying because I'm real. My punishment is for being real, more crying. <laughs> All right. Another lie. So this is Gordon Dalby. You can look up my interview with Reverend Gordon Dalby. He's one of my favorite writers. A real man is a man who's real. A real man is chaste and is courageous and is patient. Let's start at the back. The, the last one. When St. Paul was inspired by the Holy Spirit to write his letters, in the first letter that he wrote to the Corinthians, now Corinth now, Corinth would be a combination of the Castro of San Francisco district meets, I don't know, Amsterdam. To call a woman a Corinthian was to say something very despicable about her. So he's writing to the Christians in this very fallen city of Corinth in Greece. And he has a list of love's qualities. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1. Yeah, I know you know it. It's the first word out of his pen, so to speak. Love is patient. I find that to be an interesting first choice. Of all the words in Greek that Paul could have used. But isn't life one long list of frustrations, one after the other? Maybe you've experienced frustration this morning like I have with this clicker. <laughs> love is patient. And if God is love, and He is, then God is patient. Who's God patient with? 
with us. So a real man is patient. You know it's patience when you feel irritated and you still stay peaceful. A real man is, 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 has courage. Now courage does not mean being fearless. I think this is a great misnomer about the virtue of courage. The brave men who have courage are not fearless. They may be filled with fear. They may be terrified. But they do the right thing anyway. That's how you know it's courage. When you feel afraid. When you get to that edge where it's uncomfortable, that's where the growth is. That's where you learn virtue. When you're out of your comfort zone, just a little bit. A real man is chaste. I have to, I have to spell it out because some people think it's C-H-A-S-E-D, like chased by chicks, right? A real man is chaste. A real man is chaste. Now, like the other virtues, you know you're being chaste when you're feeling sexual temptation. The virtues kick in in the presence of the reposing vice. That's how you know you're being virtuous. So chaste men are not wizened, sexless, non-masculine. I think that our devotion to St. Joseph has greatly been subtracted by bad Christian art. When I think of St. Joseph, I think Russell Crowe, MMA mixed martial arts. I don't think uh, Sir Ian McKellen with flowers and a cane. Okay. I think Christian art has, in a well-meaning way, tried to protect the, the, the uh, purity of the Blessed Virgin Mary. But if you read the writings of the saints, and I consider Bishop Sheen to be a saint, St. Joseph would have been younger than that, virile, chaste. Think of it. If you're God, and who doesn't like you know, putting yourself in the, in the place of God in this analogy? If you're God, and you send your son into this world with the most beautiful woman who ever lived, and you assign him to protect him and his mother from bad actors in Egypt, you want someone with menace, don't you? Can I hear an amen? St. Joseph had menace. It wasn't vengefulness. It wasn't thug life. It was a real man. And real men are chaste and have courage and are patient. Men don't really warm up to the average church environment. Is not the church environment in so many parishes a little on the feminine side? Now, God, this is not anti-woman by any, any stretch. The church would collapse without women. Who's going to make the sandwiches? Who's going to fold the tables? Who's going to... Oh, hold on now. Oh, see? The crowd turned ugly. <laughs> Who teaches the kids? Who forms families? Women are certainly the spine. By the way, I, have, I personally believe that women are the stronger sex. We have the XY chromosome. That's the damaged one. They are the XX. Most prisoners are men. Most, pe most spouses who leave their families for drugs happen to be men. Violent crime is mostly committed by men. So we're in the greater need of grace. If you go to the average church, Protestant or Catholic, on any given day, it's going to be 60, 40, sometimes 70, 30 in favor of women. Too many men leave faith formation to the moms. There's a lot of data that indicates, this is from Europe, this is from Switzerland, when a child comes to Christ and brings the message of the gospel to the family, the family converts under 30% of the time. If the wife and mother comes to Christ and brings the message to the home, it jumps to over 50%. When the father comes to Christ and brings the faith to the home, it's over 90%. Why is that? Because you and I are the exemplar of Jesus Christ in our homes. They're looking to us for leadership, not for authoritarianism, it's not machismo. It's servant leadership. The willingness to see yourself as something to give away. That's why we have selves, so we can give them away. I just want to mention music. Not all music is created equal, but some of the music adds to the sentimental kind of easy soft thing and men are born to fight we want fighting music 
We want music that inspires and gets us excited about being men. So, language of warriors engaged in a battle. Men identify with that. They warm up to it. I mentioned this earlier. More men successfully commit suicide. Most in utero miscarriages are boys. Did you know that for every every 114 conceptions, to put the other way, there are 114 <coughs> conceptions to every 100 births, and most of miscarriages are boys. So we are anthropologically the weaker sex. Piggybacking on this, think of the movies that resonate with men, and I'll, I'll kind of track through this in a funny way. I'll get, the, I'll get the name wrong, and you can correct me. Number one, it's a book by Tom Wolfe. It's about the astronauts. It was called the, um, the iffy stuff. What was it? The okay stuff. The right stuff. See that movie? Real, it's Sam Shepard. Great film, 1979. The right stuff. How about that uh, the Mel Gibson movie about William Wallace, uh, Safe Heart? Remember that? <laughs> All together now? Great heart. Gladiator. Remember Russell Crowe stars at the, as the, uh, the Roman soldier guy, Minimus? Remember that? <laughs> All together now? Maximus. Maximus. Then there's the, the, there's the Western, based on a, a Japanese movie, and it's been remade again. It's called The, uh, the Mediocre Seven. Remember that? <laughs> Magnificent Seven. Then there's the 1924 uh, Winter Olymp uh, Olympics in Paris movie about the runners, British made. It, was, it won Best uh, Oscar in 1981, uh, Chariots of Mediocrity. Remember that? <laughs> Chariots of Fire. It wasn't The Nap of the Christ by Mel Gibson, was it? The Passion of the Christ. And finally, one of my favorite movies to recommend to men. Yes, there are potty words. Don't show it to your eight-year-old. But I do recommend that you watch, if you haven't seen it, Clint Eastwood's Gran Torino. It's not Hugo. It's not the Ford Focus. <laughs> no, uh-oh. The Focus owners turn ugly. Gran Torino. Who's seen Gran Torino? Clint Eastwood movie. Gran Torino is a magnificent film about m masculine modeling. And the story is told through the, through the Hmong boy, the Asian boy who lives next door to Walt Kowalski. And he's given four models of what it means to be a man. The feminine man, or the feminized man, represented by his sister. He's under his mom's and his sister's thumb. His father's not even in the picture. We never know what happened to, to Tao's dad. The violent man, model, represented by his cousin. Remember the one who wants to join the gang? The hypermasculine parody of manhood, represented by the potty word speaking porn magazine viewing barber, remember him? Then finally, the Christian model, which is Walt himself. Men identify with movies that are not safe. The maxim is true. Men will cook. This is why uh, barbecues exist. Men will cook if danger is involved. <laughs> And our Lord Jesus Christ is the exemplar of manhood. He's the perfect man. He is God, but he's also man. I think it's easy for Catholics to slide into one error or the other. But really, he's both. Fully God, fully man. He cried. He felt lonely. He got tired. He felt fed up. He was in touch with his anger. He kept the anger righteous. He longed for things. He missed people. He was let down. He was really the, the perfect balanced personality. This is tracking to the secret key of manhood. Think of, of, of a pyramid, and this is the lowest level of, of uh, male identity. And it's the public role we might have. Maybe we're chairman of the board of something. Maybe we are on the golf committee. Maybe we're parts of the, uh, part of the Knights of Columbus. Parish council whatever it is, we're involved in the pro-life movement. That's the lower part. That's the, in a way, the least important part, although it's the most visible part. And then up, the next level on the pyramid, we're fathers, those of us who are blessed to be fathers. How many dads here? Can you imagine your life 
without your kids? Doesn't it go to the heart of who you are? I started late to the father game. I wish I'd started a lot earlier. No one told me how fun it was and how devastating to be made fun of by your teenage daughter. <laughs> so we're, we're fathers and then we're husbands. It's more important to be a good husband than it is to be a good father. Yes, it's important to be a good father. Don't misunderstand me. But in the order of being, you have to first be a good husband. The worldly way of thinking of parenthood is that there's these invisible love strings between the mom and the kids, and then there's these, these invisible love strings, which is the dad's love for the kids. But really, kids are the, the fruit and the crown of that first unity, that two-in-one flesh called marriage. We're the invisible love of husband for wife, and the invisible love of wife for husband becomes incarnate. It literally becomes one in the person of the child. Which is why marriage is under special attack today by the devil, as is the Catholic Church. Why do you think Methodists, Jews, Muslims, Southern Baptists, Zoroastrians don't make the New York Times every day? Because the enemy knows when we're over the target, more flack goes up. The attacks on the church from within and without are a sign of things going right. It means we are better conformed to our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave us in baptism some fine print. If you look in your baptism certificate, if the world hates me, it will hate you. Public role, family role as father, intimate role as husband, and the most important one of all, which is the key to everything else, is sonship. Sonship. Yes, we're sinners. Yes, you and I have fallen natures. But through Christ, His death on the cross, His resurrection, and the sacraments of the church, we are made into sons, adopted into the family of God. A slave, says St. Paul in Romans, has no, no guaranteed place in the home, but the son does. The son has rights. So we have to see ourselves, when we look in the mirror, as children of the king of the universe, who is as close to us as the nearest tabernacle. If the Holy See announced the second coming of Jesus Christ tomorrow at noon, he would be just as real then as he is now with us in the Most Holy Eucharist. And it's from him that we learn fatherhood, because he's also a spiritual father, and sonship. We learn sonship from him because that was his identity. He was known because of his relationship to the Father. And we have to trust our Father in Heaven, as He did. If you think that the Heavenly Father loves Jesus more than He loves you, you might not have had the, the Gospel marinate deep enough. The Father wants to bring us into the torrent of His love to his son. We can step into that torrent and we can be cleansed. I know a lot of people here maybe have never darkened the doors to a church. I'm so glad you're here. Small is huge. It was a small decision to come here today, but I can guarantee you, you will never forget this day. You will probably forge new friendships, maybe new apostolates. Sonship is the key. Nemo dot quad non habet. That's a term from law. Nemo dat non quad habet. It means you can't give what you don't have. If you don't have a way to finish the sentence, I'm Catholic because, you're not going to be a very effective evangelist. If you don't have a solid relationship with your earthly father, you're going to be hobbled in your ability to understand that God is Father. But the good news is that God the Father sent His Son and through the wounds of His Son, He can enter into our wounds. If we have wounds based on our relationship with our Father, or lack thereof. We have a crisis of fatherhood. There's a lot of walking wounded men. Maybe, maybe it's you. In times of my life, it was me. Without a GPS, where am I going? Why do I exist? I might make 400000 a year, but I don't know why I exist.
the wounds of Jesus Christ give him street credibility where he can tell us, brother, my son, I know what it's like to suffer. I know what it's like to feel abandoned. Let me come into your wounds because my stripes, my wounds heal you. That's the deal. We give, we give, us, we give our Lord our time, He gives us His eternity. We give Him our weakness, He gives us our strength. Pretty good deal. He is no fool to give up what He cannot keep to gain what He cannot lose. I'll say it again. He is no fool to give up what He cannot keep to gain what He cannot lose. Our mothers cannot impart masculinity to us. Think of it. Brothers, we come into this world for the first nine months of our existence, we were in the womb of a woman and, and we sat nestled beneath her heart for nine months. And then we were born. Then people could see us visibly. And then we're surrounded by nurses. And then we go to Auntie M. And then we go to junior, you know, uh, uh, middle school, elementary school. We're surrounded by women. And it's great because they're better at it. They can, I, I can barely zero task when I think of the things that my wife can pull off. But especially a young boy is waiting for the voice of the father to take him apart from the world of women and put him on his own two feet and say, you are my little man. You are my son. And the little boy needs to see in his father, I want to be like him. That's my model. And if we feel not up to that task, I have good news. Because our relationship with Christ can make us into the man we want to be. That's what it means to be a saint. A saint is not a plastic cast, unreachable, super, you know, idealized, impossible standard. Sainthood is our true self. And our true self is hidden. Like dross that needs to be burned away. And it hurts to be, have your dross burned away. It hurts to be chiseled. Imagine when Michelangelo was sculpting Moses, if that marble could speak, it would probably say, all right, that's enough. I don't want to be Moses anymore. Just leave me as a block of marble. Our Lord wants to make us into saints. He wants the light inside us to shine brighter than any light shining outside of us. And that's why we were, we were created. I hope you get to confession today. Don't wait. If you haven't been in a while, go. Don't even think about it. Well, maybe, maybe next Tuesday there's a 7 o'clock. Go today. Priests are garbage men. Take out your garbage. <laughs> they take it away. <laughs> Bye-bye. There's a famous story of, of St. Catherine of Siena who received locutions from our Lord, from the, uh, the Heavenly Father. They're called the Dialogues. And she went to her spiritual director and she told them that, that Jesus was speaking to her in, in an audible way. And, he was skeptical, and he said, all right, uh, Catherine, I would like you to uh, ask Jesus what you confessed, and then get back to me, because we just went to confession today with me. So that's, that's correct, Father. So she did. And so she had another locution, and uh, she went back to her spiritual director. He said, did, what, what, what were your sins? What did, what did, he, what did he say? And she said, uh, he didn't remember. And that's when the priest knew it was real. He doesn't remember. And don't worry about father remembering. Priests don't remember. They've, they've, as they say in Brooklyn, they've hoid it all. There's no blockbuster you can share with the confessors today. They haven't heard 50 ways till Sunday. So I encourage you to go and receive that beautiful sacred heart surgery. We give him our hearts and he gives us his. Also part of the deal. A pretty good deal. The Lord is a warrior. The Lord is his name. So we need to be comfortable with our identity as fighters, as warriors, because we're in a war. Yes, it's a cultural war. It is. It's a culture war. We're in a culture war. We're not fighting each other so much as we're fighting to be the ones that get to tell the story of what America is, of what the West is, of what the source of science is, which is God. That's what the war is about. But it's really a spiritual war. It's a spiritual battle. Our enemy is not flesh and blood, says St. Paul. It's powers and principalities, and we have an enemy, brothers. The enemy is the devil, Satan, 
is real and he hates your guts. He hates that you're here. He hates that I'm talking now. He wants to destroy all your hope and all of your joy. He wants to rob it because he wants as many people to join in his re uh, rebellion as possible. The battle between God and Satan is over forever. Because of the cross, the score is forever. Jesus won, Satan zero. But you and I can fail. You and I can stumble. But it's not mandatory to. And a good fresh start is to go to confession. You get to hear the, f the most beautiful words this side of heaven. I absolve you from your sins. That's not Bishop Burns or, or Father Joseph or whoever the priest is. That's, that's our Lord Jesus Christ. First person singular. I absolve you from your sins. That way, whatever fear you have will vanish. You'll get your joy back. You'll get your true self back. Then you can go back into your homes as the man closer to the, to the one God made you to be. And everybody around you will notice. What's with that guy? Hmm, he seems more patient. The Lord's a warrior. The Lord is his name. The Lord your God is with you. He is mighty to save. He's not average to save. He's not pretty good to save. He's mighty to save. John 8, 32, 36. And because your sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. I heard the, this great scripture scholar, rest his soul, um, Father Francis Martin, explain in a talk once about the, the Aramaic word Abba. He said it really doesn't mean daddy. Daddy, he said, is a little bit sentimental. Abba really means Papa. It's a little sturdier than Daddy, and it's the closest thing you can say about a father. That's what our Lord wants us to call His Father, who's ours, Papa. Saint Teresa of Lisieux writes in her autobiography of a soul, her story of a soul, that she went to adoration once and she fell asleep and she woke up and, oh, what time is it? Oh my gosh, I, I feel kind of guilty. I should have been awake and waiting with the Lord consciously and giving Him my all. And she heard the Lord say to her in her heart, Therese, it's okay. A father is equally happy if his daughter is asleep or awake as long as she's in his lap. Isn't that beautiful? We don't have to do anything. Think of how embarrassingly low the standard is to be a Catholic. It's the, it's the most humiliating low standard of, of all. You have to be a sinner. I can do that. <laughs> Me, do that. Easy. But then we grow in our relationship with Christ. Then we celebrate the sacraments. And then we realize that God is calling us to a higher life, to a life of magnificence. And the standard for the, for, for the Christian life is not the first floor or the second floor. It's not even the ceiling. The standard is the sky. And you can't get to the sky without wings. We need the Holy Spirit to soar, to flow. And it's scary. You step off that ledge. Is it going to happen, Lord? Are you with me? He's with you. Be not afraid is one of the most often repeated phrases in Scripture. It's the first thing out of the mouth. Remember St. John Paul II in October 1978? Be not afraid. Why did he say that so often? Because he knew we're prone to being afraid. So we need to hear it again and again. To be not afraid. Pro Proverbs 27 verse 6. I love this. Wounds from a friend can be trusted, but an enemy multiplies kisses. If someone cares about you as a brother and is willing to tell you the truth about yourself, maybe a habit or a behavior or some little quirk, thank him. The world is full of people who don't want to, they don't want to say anything to anybody that might challenge them. And our enemy smothers us with kisses. How does the enemy smother us with, uh, smother us with kisses? Well, flattery. The enemy, uh, enemy of our soul is doing an excellent job through pornography to destroy marriages and masculinity. Porn use makes men into emotional midgets. We know that. Who can engage with pixelated images of women who never say the word no, but can't give themselves to another woman. Multiplying us with, with kisses, flattery, empty flattery, vanity. First Corinthians 10.
This is my father's favorite Bible verse, 1 Corinthians 10, 13. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you're tempted, he will also provide a way out so you can stand up under it. Notice, I love how the word of God is, it's true in its little finesse of all details. Stand up under it. Not sit down under it. Not lie in a hammock under it. Stand up under it. We sang the song this morning, His grace is enough. Not His grace is overpowering. Not His grace will force its way into our hearts and minds. But it is enough. The great St. Paul, whose shadow, whose touch could heal people, who performed unbelievable miracles, had his own thorn in the flesh, didn't he? And three times he asked the Lord, Enough. Heal me. Take it away. And our Lord did not take it away. And he said, my grace is enough for you, Paul. Live with it. Stand up under it. Proverbs 10.9 The man of integrity walks securely, but he who takes crooked paths will be found out. How true is this in every other headline today? The truth will out. You can't get around the truth. God is the truth. The one antidote, I believe, to living a duplicitous life or a double life or a life of hypocrisy is what I mentioned earlier. It's confession. Disclosing to the priest and to the high priest Jesus Christ, look, I did this. I'm not going to point fingers anywhere else except at the man in the mirror. That way, your secret's disclosed. It's up. And you are found out. Christ find out. He, he finds out what you did. And his response is not to condemn you. It's not to shame you. It's to forgive you. It's to impart the reason why he came to this earth to die under torture so that we would know our price tag. Our price tag is the crucifix. Everyone wants to know, how much does it cost? How much is it? Did you get a deal? Was it a discount? Our price tag, what we're worth to our Creator, is the crucifix. I want you to pay attention to this because uh, John, they're they're called the the sons of thunder. This is Matthew's account of the calling of the apostles. I'm kind of uh, adding a train car to what Bishop Burns said earlier so well. As he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon who's called Peter and Andrew, his brother. They were casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. These, Andrew and Peter, they're, they're, I mean, these guys were close to their father. They, they fished together. And here's Jesus, follow me, and they dropped their nets. They didn't tarry. They didn't debate. They didn't discern. I lived with a, a religious community in Canada for a year when I thought the Lord was asking me to be a priest. It was called the Companions of the Cross. Two of the members are now bishops up in Canada. A really great, great group of priests. And the, the founder... Father Bob Bedard, who I think will one day be Saint Bob Bedard, uh, used to say that as soon as the word discernment showed up in the church, right, everything's about discernment, nobody's made a decision since. (laughs) So, these men decided they wanted to follow him. And going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets, And he called them. There's that word again. It's like magic. Immediately. Or (laughs) diatelli. There we go. Immediately, they left the boat and their father and followed him. They left their boat and their father. This Jesus must have had something about him that drew them to him so fast and so profoundly. Matthew 4, verse 21 through 22. This is why Jesus is not safe. You want a safe path in your life? Don't follow Jesus. He didn't say, take up your cross yearly, did he? It was monthly, of course. Take up your cross monthly and follow me. No, wait a second, it was weekly. Take up your cross weekly. 
All together now. Take up your cross. Daily. Daily. Daily taking up of the cross doesn't sound very safe to me. It's not always fun. Sometimes it hurts. Sometimes things happen to us that we didn't want to happen. Or we wish something would happen and it doesn't happen. Jesus is not safe. I want you to meet Artful Eddie. It's, I always wonder, like when I'm listening to a talk, what's the one takeaway line? There's usually one kind of flaming dart that's the reason you came here. I don't know what it is. Maybe it's some, nothing that I said. Maybe it's something that Bishop Burns said or what Father Mitch said. But think about the hundreds of speeches that Martin Luther King Jr. gave. He gave hundreds of homilies, sermons, public talks. He wrote letters. But what do we remember him for? Four words. I have a dream. Gone with the Wind, summarized with one line. It's a three-hour movie. Frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn. By the way, people under 30, Gone with the what? what? <laughs> yes. Look it up in a history book. Right? So Artful Eddie was from St. Louis, and he was an attorney, a very sharp guy, had three kids. But he, he, was, a, he was a kind of a Catholic, kind of a mechanical mic. He really wasn't plugged in to the Lord, but he was, uh, he was a cultural Catholic. And one day he decided to leave his wife and the kids. His eldest son was named Butch. And they left St. Louis and moved to Chicago. And this goes to small is huge, something I mentioned earlier. Artful Eddie became friends. There he is there. There's the handsome charmer. It's from the Chicago Tribune. That's Artful Eddie. He became friends with the woman who was a widow of the man who invented the mechanical rabbit. Remember the rabbit that goes around the, the uh, dog racetrack to keep the dogs going forward? So he ripped her off, got all the royalties from that invention, made a, a huge wad of cash, cash, and left his wife and kids, moves from St. Louis to Chicago, where he, uh, there's his son Butch there. That's Eddie and Butch. He meets uh, this man, Al Capone. Al takes a shine to Art Folletti because he's a really great lawyer. He knows fine print. He knows the difference between what you can do and what you can prove. And he, sh he sets up sham corporations, gambling, casino, prostitution, the whole racket. He arranges hits to be made out a bad actor. And he makes even more money under Al Capone. And one day, Art Folletti made a small decision. He turned in Al Capone accepted a wire for the US government and brought down Al Capone. He's memorialized as the nerdy uh, accountant in the Kevin Costner movie, The Untouchables. A cop takes him aside of the trial and says, why did, you, uh, why did you give up Al Capone? What was in it for you? And Eddie, as he walks out, says, I, I wanted to do it for my sons to give them a chance. Al Capone went to jail, died of syphilis, the mob never forgot. And one night, about three years later, on the corner of Ogden and Rockwell, 5 a.m., shotgun blasts rang out, striking Art Folletti's car. He was rendered unconscious, and they finished him off while he sat, slumped over in his car. His son, Butch, ended up going to the uh, West Point Naval Academy, became a, the flyer of F-13 Hellcats. That's his actual plane here in the foreground, the F-1. That's him meeting President Roosevelt. Why did he meet President Roosevelt? Well, in the early 40s, as the Pacific Theater was ramping up, Butch took off with his wingman from the USS Lexington. And they were doing a recon over the horizon, four or five miles away, and they spotted what they thought were two Japanese Zeros. Zeros couldn't carry as much armament, but they were faster than the Hellcats. So Butch said to his wingman, okay, let's go, straight ahead. We've got tw they had 2,100 of their brothers down on that ship below. And they engaged the Zeros, and that's when the two became four. They were hiding behind the first two Zeros. <coughs> and Butch said to his wingman, open fire, and we'll, get, we'll draw attention from the rest of the crew, and we'll down these guys. 
Butch's, Butch's wingman's gun jammed. Butch gave it the whole nine yards. There were nine Japanese zeros. Five of them fell into the sea. President Roosevelt called that the greatest act of aviation heroism in U.S. history. We got the highest medal from the president. Married a Catholic girl, moved to Coronado named Kathleen. And then years later, while the war was still going on, Butch's Hellcat was downed for reasons we don't know. He was lost at sea. But the citizens of Chicago don't go a day without thinking about their fallen son because they named the airport after Butch O'Hare. Small is huge. I don't know what small thing you're dealing with. I don't know what decision you can make today. Maybe it's going to confession for the first time or making a really good confession where you, you disclose that thing that you think God might not even know about. But small is huge. And you and I are the average of the five people we spend the most time with. So get plugged into a men's group. Get plugged into a Bible study. Knights of Columbus, Curcio. Take what happens here and integrate it into what you're doing next Tuesday and the Tuesday after and the Tuesday after. It doesn't have to be a big whoop. You don't have to have a podcast or a radio show. You don't have to be on television. You don't have to write a thing. You just have to be you and open to the you that God is making you into. Father Bob's prayer every morning was, Lord, I love this. Take this to the bank. Lord, I am not ready, but I'm willing. Keep in touch. We're going to Germany, by the way, next uh, 2020 in the spring. Catholic Bavaria, we're going to see the famous live action Oberammergau Passion Play. It only happens every 10 years. We're going to Dachau, we're going to Regensburg. Uh, Father Joseph promised we would get half price on German beer. I think that. Uh, because we sort of know each other now, it's probably implicit. Uh, take a picture of that if you want. The um, patrickcoffin.media slash pilgrimage. I have a membership site. If you want to check that out, coffinnation.com. If you send out to Coffin Nation, we only open the doors every quarter. But if you go there, um, you, can, you can just have that at it for free. I will be at the table. I want to thank you so much for listening. And maybe I can start stop this way. I'll say the first part. Be a saint. What else? God bless you richly. <laughs>